Well, we are continuing this series going through Colossians. And uh, if you remember uh, last week, uh, we, uh, we, we looked at a lot of different things that uh, Paul was uh, giving his heart for the church, uh, ways that we can actually grow in maturity. Uh, and really the big way that he was talking about a lot last week was, uh, was being in community. Uh, that because we all have blind spots in various ways, we need each other to be able to speak into each other's lives because uh, a blind spot, by definition, you cannot see. Uh, so we need other people to see things for us. And, uh, and this week, uh, we're, we're gonna jump into a, a, a pretty big topic um, because it's something that is constantly knocking at our doors and we're gonna see that even in uh, this first early church in uh, Colossae, they were dealing with the same thing. Uh, this, this, uh, this idea, uh, just some, some bad teaching that was going on in their lives. And this happens all over the place uh, in our culture today. Just all kinds of different things that are competing for uh, the glory and worship of Jesus and things that are trying to draw us away from Christ and into other things that we think are more important or more beautiful or more fulfilling or more purposeful or give us more significance. And we need to really equip ourselves as a community, as friends and family, uh, to be able to recognize these things so that we can say, no, we're not gonna buy into that uh, we know and we believe that Jesus is enough. And uh, we live in this world today where uh, tolerance is king. Uh, that being politically correct is really our national religion. Uh, where that is, like we're all supposed to uh, at least abide in that. You can, we, you can have this belief or that belief, but at least we need to be politically correct. Uh, we, uh, we, we make um, uh, not offending people more important than really actually loving people. But then we call it love, even though it's actually not. And so we're constantly battling this thing, like what is this line that we uh, walk, this, this, very, this, this tightrope, thank you, uh, this tightrope of uh, wanting to speak the truth but in love. Okay, no, notice that he doesn't say uh, keep silence in love, right? He says speak the truth but in love. Not speak the truth in judgment either. So not this and not this, but how do we walk this, this middle line? And this is what we're gonna be looking at today because it's everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. But what we're gonna look at specifically today is because it's, it's this, is there's lots of bad teaching coming from all kinds of places, uh, from billboards to magazines to TV, the internet, all kinds of uh, places. But we're gonna specifically look at, because this is what Paul was looking at, was bad teaching that was actually coming from within the church. Because just because we all say Christian, or we all say we love Jesus, doesn't mean that we all have this like healthy teaching these healthy understandings because we're influenced by so many other sources. And so as a family, we need to come together and say, okay, let's look at this and let's really figure out as much as we possibly can who Jesus really is, who God really is, how he interacts with us so we can spot these things. The fact of the matter is this, is that if, if Jesus preached the kinds of sermons that we're hearing a lot these days, from some of the even big guys, whatever, Jesus never would have been crucified. He never would have been killed. If he just came out and said, hey guys, I came here to make y'all rich, bring a bunch of health, give you a bunch of good stuff, he would have never been crucified. They would be like, sweet man, let's go, let's do this. But, but Jesus did not come with that message. Uh, he, he came with a very different message. And so, uh, so we have to really now analyze uh, what it is that we really actually believe. And part of my job uh, as a, a pastor, as a friend, uh, as a Christian, um, a pastor means to shepherd. And shepherds don't just feed good stuff. Or I, I, my job isn't just to lead you to a nice green pasture so you can eat healthy food, but my job also is to protect you from wolves. Uh, it's to uh, protect you even from wolves that are in sheep's clothing. So wolves that actually look like sheep. And so it's not my favorite part of the job, 
Uh, over the course of this last year, uh, I, I think I've very rarely even uh, brought up these kinds of things. Uh, I prefer preaching Jesus rather than preaching about things that aren't Jesus. You know, I, like whenever I'm done with a sermon like this, I'm like, all right, let's get into next week so we can just get back to the main thing. But these are necessary. These kinds of uh, texts are necessary. Paul, almost in every single letter he wrote to every church, he pointed out someone even by name and said, stay away from that guy. He, he says he's a Christian, he says he's a believer, he says he's got the truth, stay away from him. Named him out because he cares about the church, he cares about what they eat, what they drink, what they think, what they feel, he cares about all that stuff. So Paul was not afraid to not be politically correct he, he was not afraid to call people out and say, don't listen to that guy, don't, don't go around that guy, he's gonna ruin you. He's gonna rob your love of Jesus. So, so this isn't my favorite topic, but it's nonetheless a necessary one. Now the thing is, uh, before we uh, pray and get into Colossians, we don't know a whole lot about the particular bad teaching that was going on in Colossae. Uh, so what we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna go through the text, I'm gonna share with you at least what we, what we do know, and we're gonna pinpoint a few things that, that was going on there that's kind of been common for us. So we're gonna jump off a little bit into something uh, that's uh, some, some teaching that's a little more relevant to us today, uh, simply because we don't know exactly uh, what it was that they were dealing with. Uh, so we're gonna take the opportunity to look at what the church today is actually dealing with. So sound good? Yeah, all right. Well, let's pray and then we'll jump into Colossians. Father God, um, we know that uh, you've called us, Lord, to not just, um, not just seed and, and water, uh, but also to pull weeds. Uh, if we wanna be a healthy garden of a church, if we wanna grow, we wanna have fruit and have roots that go deep and roots that go wide, uh, we need to pull weeds. Um, for that, us, that means uh, sin that's in our heart, that means uh, things that are uh, trying to clamor for our attention, uh, things in our life that are trying to rob us of health and uh, spiritual health and nutrients and the things that we need to really grow deep in our uh, love for you, our worship for you. And uh, this is not an easy task. Some of those weeds go deep, but some of those weeds have stronger roots than, than we do even. And so Lord, uh, I, I pray God that you would just help us to, um, uh, and this is my prayer God, is not that we would just simply uh, talk about and expose um, other people that have different beliefs, but that we would expose in our own hearts the beliefs that should not be there. Uh, God, that's, that's what I'm after this morning. I want us to look into our hearts and have your word shine into our hearts and have people help look at blind spots in our hearts and that we would say, hey, you're, you're not believing the right thing here. You're eating some, some bad food. So God, help us to have that discernment, um, not just for each other, but for ourselves. So we thank you, God. We need you this morning. We need your spirit to guide us and teach us in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's open up to Colossians chapter two. We're gonna be in verse 16 through 19. Colossians two sixteen says this. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. Now this is coming out of uh, the section where he just talked about the gospel, that we've been accepted by Christ, that we've been adopted, not through anything outward we've done by the circumcision of our hearts, we've been adopted into the family of God that he's nailed all the requirements that we've had, anything that, that was against us, and all the sin that was against us, he nailed that all to the cross. Okay, all of that was nailed at the cross. So he says, so in light of that truth, since you've been forgiven and accepted, then therefore, don't let anyone pass judgment on you 
and questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or new moon or a Sabbath. So those are all things referring to some, some Jewish traditions. So, so it seems that this, this teacher or this teaching that's coming in, what they're trying to tell these Christians is, yeah, Jesus, that's great, but you also still need to do all this religious stuff in order to keep Jesus happy with you. Like, cool, you believe in him, but you still have to observe the Sabbath, you still have to do all these festivals, you still have to do all these things in order for him to be really, truly pleased with you. That him nailing your sin to the cross wasn't quite good enough for him to love you in the way that, that we want. And so, so Paul's saying, no, you don't have to do all that religious stuff. Jesus really is enough for you to be accepted into his family. What he did for you is enough. You can rest in that. Okay, so, so these guys were bringing in some old Jewish type teachings. Jesus plus whatever it is equals everything and that's just not true, Paul's saying. So verse 17, he's saying these things, these, these Old Testament practices, these religious things are just shadows of the things to come. So meaning that uh, in the Old Testament, when God gave us things like the Ten Commandments, when he gave us these uh, rituals that we would do, these cleansing rituals, all these things did was point towards a savior that would come eventually and truly cleanse us. A savior that would fully uh, fulfill all the Ten Commandments. All these things that were given to uh, the Jews in the past were meant to point towards Jesus in the future who would fulfill it. And so now he says, the substance is Christ. So, so if we have Christ now, why do you need the shadow? Why grasp onto something that was actually pointing to something greater? If you've got the greater thing, why go back to the old thing? So, so we, we keep working for our salvation. We keep trying to do things to keep God happy with it. He's like, why do that? You've already got the one who completely satisfied God on your behalf. So just cling on to him and let go of all your, your performance stuff, all your religious deeds. You don't need that stuff. You can't fulfill it. That's just a, uh, just a shadow. Grab onto the substance. Grab onto Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's all that you need. And he says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on, there's a big word, asceticism. Uh, asceticism is this idea that the more we abstain from things, and not just sinful things, but even physical things, like uh, uh, any kind of you know, uh, money or any kind of uh, worldly pleasures, whether it's sports or activities or hobbies, if we, just, uh, if we just stay away from all that stuff, we'll become more spiritual. If we just, if we just uh, live this separate life that is kind of monkish, we go off and we live and we, just, we have no interaction with the world. The more we do that, the more holy we become. He's like, that's not true. That does not make you holy. Only Christ can make you holy. Only Jesus in your heart, the Holy Spirit transforming you from the inside out. It's not your outer deeds that make you holy. It's what is going on inside of you. The Holy Spirit alone is what sanctifies us and actually makes us holy and changes us and transforms us. And, and so, so for us, we, we, we don't want to live this life saying, well, I have to do this whole list of things and abstain from all these things for God to accept me. Okay, Christ already came and did everything that was required and he nailed that requirement to the cross. Your, your sin is paid for. All the, all the failures you've had, Christ didn't fail in those things and he gives you credit for it. it it's crazy. It's like you get to, it's kind of like get to like look over his shoulder and cheat on the test. You know what I mean? Like you're like writing down his answers and you get credit for it. You, you pass the grade because Jesus did it for you. And, and we recognize that doing physical things does not, that, that doesn't make us holy. The Jews tried it for thousands of years, didn't work. The point is that it doesn't work. Only Christ came and fulfilled everything necessary and then he credited our account. The picture that you get in the Bible, the word is imputing and it means that he imputed, he took all of his bank account that was full and overflowing and he dumped it into our empty bank account. He actually dumped it into our negative account you know, like overdraft fees, you know? So he takes all of his income, all of his, his whole bank account, and he imputes it, he deposits it into ours, and so now we go and we, we check our balance, and it's full! And yet we still try to uh, go out and, and earn, 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 earn. He's like, you've got enough, guys. Don't try to pay me back. I gave it to you, it's yours. Okay, so that's what Paul is, is kind of warring against here. Basically, at the end of the day, these guys were saying that you need more than Jesus. That, that Jesus isn't quite fulfilling enough. You need to do some more stuff. 
And this is where we're gonna jump off a little bit for us today. Uh, these guys are insisting on asceticism and worship of angels or invoking angels, calling upon angels. They're holding and, and they're going on in detail about visions. Talk about this, this greater spiritual experience that we need that's, that really fulfills us. They're being puffed up without reason by their sensuous minds. They're just being kind of whisked away into this really uh, emotional, sensual, spiritual encounter because Jesus isn't quite enough. We need to have this, this deeper thing. That's really where it's at. That's the, the real meat and potatoes in our faith. And they're not holding fast. They're not holding on to the head, which is Jesus. See, they're chasing after this experience. They're chasing after all this other stuff, this worship and invocation of angels and these, you know, uh, these, these uh, visions and this deeper sensual thing, this experience, this encounter, rather than holding on just simply to the beauty and glory of Jesus, their Savior, from whom the whole body, Jesus, is the source from where the whole body is nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments and grows with the growth of it's from God. A, few, or a couple verses here just on the importance of understanding uh, good, healthy teaching for our, our sake and for the glory of the Lord. Uh, this is in 2 Timothy chapter four. Uh, Timothy was uh, Paul's young protege. He called him a son in the faith, loved Timothy dearly. Timothy was the uh, overseer, the pastor uh, at a, a real good, a thriving church in Ephesus. And he says to Timothy, I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Okay, preach the word. Don't be preaching angels and visions and all this stuff. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. So we need to be rebuking each other, correcting each other, holding each other accountable, with complete patience, though, with each other. Okay, that's a key little word right there. We kind of overlook that one a lot. We like to rebuke, we don't like to have patience. With complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. The word sound means healthy in the Greek. There's gonna be a time when people don't wanna listen to good healthy teaching. It's boring, it's not as interesting, not as fun. I don't, it doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't, all these things. We just, we want the experience. We're, we want to go to something that really just, just grabs me and just makes me feel good and, and those kinds of things. That they won't endure healthy, sound teaching, but with itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers that suit their own passions. We're just going to go look for the thing that, that, that we like. We don't want to be, don't challenge me. Don't, don't offend me. Don't insult me. Uh, tell me what I want to hear. Now, we do this not just in our churches, but we do this even with our friendships, don't we? We, we, we? we ask some advice from somebody, and they just say, well, here's what the word says. You're like, I don't really like that. I'm going to go to this friend over here because he'll tell me what I want to hear. All right, so this isn't just in church. This is also in our friendships, that we go and we find people who agree with us to justify whatever it is that we want to decide and we'll keep going until we find that person. We'll accumulate for ourselves teachers to suit our own passions. And we'll turn away from listening to the truth and we'll wander off into myths. Just like this, like others, just stuff, this make-believe kind of hocus-pocus kind of stuff. It's this real like um, emotionalism and these, these feeling-based beliefs that aren't rooted in truth, they're just their myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded. Think clearly about what you're hearing, about what you're thinking, about what you're reading, about what you're watching and observing. Endure suffering. It's interesting you put suffering in this, uh, this little text because we will suffer for standing up for truth. In some form or fashion, we will. At some point in your life, if you're really standing for truth, you'll suffer in, in some way, even if it's just simple criticism or being accused of, of being all kinds of different things. Do the work of an evangelist, which means to preach the good news, fulfill your ministry. Galatians 1, 6, I love this. Uh, Paul says to the Galatians in chapter one, verse six, so his opening letter, his opening words, 
uh, he's saying, hey guys, it's me, it's Paul. Uh, and he jumps right into it. He goes, I am astonished. I'm shocked. I am floored that you're so quickly deserting him, God, who called you in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to another gospel. I'm surprised it was so quick. I preached the word, you got saved, I'm gone for just a little bit, and, and you've already wandered off into a different gospel. You've already wandered from the truth of Jesus and his grace, and now you're chasing after this other stuff already. I'm, I'm shocked that it happened this quick. I mean, I, he's like, I, I know we're all sinful people, and we're gonna do it, but I didn't think it would be this short of a time. I'm astonished that you already are off and running, chasing after a different gospel. And then he clarifies in verse seven, he goes, not that there actually is such thing as another gospel. There's really only one. Not that there is another one, but there's some teachers among you who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And even if we, Paul says, even if I come to you or even if an angel in heaven comes to you and preaches to you a different gospel, Count them as cursed. So, so it'd be like this, guys. Like if I'm sitting here and I've been telling you guys about Jesus and the gospel for the last year, and if like next week or over the next course of the next few weeks, I'm starting to bring something else in, you know what you guys are supposed to do? Leave. You, you curse me, you stand up, you point your finger at me, and you say, sit down. Seriously. If I ever bring to you guys anything other than Christ and the gospel of his grace, you tell me to sit down. And if I don't sit down, you find another church. Okay, he's saying even if an angel was to appear here and give us something, now, now just picture that for a second, all right? It's like, seriously? Like if this like, angel, like this hologram type thing was standing right here, telling us to do something else, worship something else, I mean, like, That'd be pretty convincing, but he's saying don't do it. Now, because here's the thing. Uh, it says also in the word that the enemy can appear as an angel of light. That's scary, right? So, because here's the thing. Uh, crazy doesn't get you very far, okay? Crazy teaching, like, like if I came up here and said, hey guys, uh, we're gonna worship poodles from now on, uh, that wouldn't get me very far, would it? Like you guys would all just bail. Right, so, so the thing is, is, is that the point of this, the scariness of the angels can even uh, be really actually messengers of the enemy is, is that it's the subtle teaching that's scary. See, the enemy is not an idiot. He's not gonna convince me to preach poodles. Right, he's gonna, he's gonna have something else creep in. He's gonna have something else creep into your mind and your heart. He's gonna give you other wants and desires and he's gonna find really good ways to justify it. And this is why we need each other, to keep each other accountable, to, to call each other out because there's gonna be an angel of light in some form or fashion. It could be the nicest person you've ever met and you're like, oh gosh, I mean, they're so nice. They, they must be doing something, right? Like, listen to what they're actually pointing you towards. Okay, and this is very, it's very, it's very tricky. It's awkward, but it's necessary for us to be discerning, to know the word, so we're ready in season and out, as Paul said. Finishing up in Galatians here, he says, as I said it before, I'm gonna repeat myself. He goes, I'm gonna say it again. Let that person be accursed. He says, I'm not seeking the approval of man here. I'm, I'm seeking the approval of God. And for us, uh, one of the most popular uh, teachings in fo some form or fashion that we're seeing a lot of today is this thing that uh, kind of as a big blanket umbrella statement is uh, this prosperity gospel. And now this, this comes in a lot of different forms and a lot of different ways. And so uh, my, my general definition I would say for prosperity gospel is any time that we're, we're sold this belief that, uh, that we deserve more than what we currently have in Christ. Uh, that there's something else out there that we need to really live the abundant life that Jesus promised us. Uh, and the, the classic prosperity gospel is that, uh, that we need health and wealth. You've probably heard that phrase, health and wealth. Um, we, we might call it the name it and claim it, that like if you want it, I want health, so I'm just gonna name it, I'm gonna claim it. Uh, it's mine in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, I'm, I'm claiming this thing for me. Uh, name it and claim it, I call it gab and grab. 
Uh, you know, there's just different ways you can uh, look at this, but any, any time that we think that, uh, that we deserve something more than what we have, any time we think that there's something else out there that will satisfy us, that to me, that's, that's prosperity gospel, that I'm, I'm owed more. And, and, this, and the, the, that's why I say the classic is health and wealth, but, but this is anything. This is when you feel like you're owed uh, an apology from someone. So you think, well, I'm, I deserve something more prosperous than what I'm already getting. So, so what I wanna do today is uh, we're gonna look a little bit at some of the, the, the big sort of overarching uh, teachings, but I wanna, I wanna follow the trail, this, uh, this kind of family tree of this doctrine because there might not be anyone in here that's like full on prosperity gospel, but here's the thing, every single one of us believes somewhere in our heart that we deserve more in some area of your life. We all battle this. Right, last time you got frustrated getting cut off on the freeway, right? You deserve better, right? You get angry, okay? So what I'm saying is, is that we can kind of you know, laugh at some of the things that happen or we can just go, oh man, I can't believe those guys. But the fact of the matter is that we all deal with it on some level. And that's what I wanna get to today. All right, here's a couple of the, the more common things um, that some of the common teachings uh, that happened. There's uh, a thing called positive confession where you just, it's kind of like the power of positive thinking. Just, well, if you just think it and you just confess it, then it'll be yours. Just think, just think happy thoughts. That's, that's kind of what it gets down to. Name it and claim it, gab and grab, uh, calling things forth. We just, we call on Jesus to, to cause something to happen. To, now, I'm not talking about prayer. I'm not talking about asking God and requesting God and humbly saying, God, if it's your will, then, then you know, I'm, I'm asking for this thing. I'm talking about calling things forward as if we have this, the authority of God and as if, as if we are able to, uh, to rule over him. Uh, Releasing things, we, we pray that a lot, we like command things to be released. Uh, a real popular one is this uh, decree and declare, where we just, if we see something we want or we want a certain truth or reality in our life, we decree it and we just declare it for ourselves. And one of the verses that this comes out of, uh, that they point to a lot is in Job 22, 28, uh, it says this. Uh, this is Eliphaz, one of Job's friends. Remember, Job was going through a lot of hard stuff and there's all kinds, I mean, he lost everything, and Eliphaz, he gave him some advice. He goes, Job, here's what you do. Just de decide on a matter, decide what you want. You want health? Okay, decide on your matter, and it will be established for you. Just declare it in the name of Jesus. He didn't say Jesus, because Jesus hadn't been born, but he says, just declare it, and it will be established for you, and light will shine on your ways. That just sounds nice, doesn't it? You know, it just, like, what do we say to people when they're going through hard times? Well, just, you just have to have faith. Now, that's true, right? So here's the thing about some of these things. There's an element of truth in all of it. It's subtle. Okay, so, so when your, your friend is going through a hard time, you say, you just need to have faith. What, what, are you, what are you communicating to them? Having faith in God who will sustain you through hard times or just have faith that this will be done sometime soon? Because what if it's not done sometime soon? What, what are you communicating to them to put their faith in? Resolve or Jesus? Are you, are you telling them to trust Jesus in your trial or are you telling them, hey, just have faith that your trial will be done soon? Because guess what? It might not be done soon. Okay, so there's an element of all these teachings that is partly true. That's what makes it so scary for us. And we mislead our own hearts, mislead people, and we paint this improper picture of who God is and how he interacts with us. So some of the popular guys, you'll know some of these names. Uh, here's a, a guy, uh, Brian Houston, who's the lead pastor of Hillsong. You guys heard of Hillsong? Right, nice big church. Uh, he wrote a book called You Need More Money. And it wasn't like a clever title, like the book was about how you need more money. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's just kind of crazy. Like, really, do we, do we need more money? I mean, I know a lot of you guys, yes. <laughs> but, but the reality is we don't need more money. We need more of Christ in our life amidst a lack of money. Okay, uh, so now, now here's the thing, again. It's not that every single thing that these guys teach is just so wrong. But this is just a wake-up call for us to be just more discerning. And here's the thing, too. You guys need to be checking what I'm saying on Sundays. 
You know, it says in Acts that the Bereans, the people from Berea, they, they listened to Paul. I mean, this is Paul, Paul's sweet, but they would go home and they would double check everything that Paul said with the scriptures just to make sure he, he, he's on, on, on the spot. Okay, so, so don't, don't take my word for any of this. Like, I want you to, to scrutinize what I'm saying. Okay, and that's, that's my job is to help you even scrutinize me. It's a really kind of a sadistic thing that I get to do is teach you guys how to criticize me. Um, T.D. Jakes, another one. You guys ever heard, I mean, the guy's an amazing preacher. But he's very, very into the prosperity thing. Uh, Joyce Myers, another real popular one. Uh, a guy named Bill Johnson. Uh, he, uh, you ever heard of uh, Jesus Culture, the band? Uh, Bethel, uh, they're up in Reading. Uh, Bill Johnson's part of this group of men and women called the New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, they believe that the second, uh, I forget what they call it, the second um, wave or something of apostles, that they're the new apostles. Uh, and there's just, and I'll have a few quotes from him. Uh, Benny Hinn, uh, you know, he's kind of obvious and kind of on the fringe, but uh, if you've ever seen any of his stuff. Uh, Joel Osteen, uh, you know, this, the, the prosperity gospel comes in so many different forms, and sometimes the most subtle forms is uh, anything that minimizes pain, minimizes sin, minimizes negativity, we just all wanna just think happy thoughts. And we don't want to even acknowledge, and that, and that we believe that anything that's bad, anything that is um, sickness, any suffering, that's all from the enemy, and none of it can possibly be from God. That it's all from the enemy, okay? Now, I'm going to develop that a little bit, because you might have heard that and say, well, isn't that true? Uh, here's, here's a couple Joel Osteen quotes. If you develop an image of success, this could be health, abundance, joy, peace, or happiness, he says, nothing on earth will be able to hold those things from you. So all you have to do is just develop your image of success, health, wealth, prosperity, and nothing will be able to hold those things from you. Just the power of just positive confession. He says, believe, visualize, and then speak it out loud. And it's yours. He says, words release your power. They give life to your dreams. And he says, there's a miracle in your mouth. A uh, couple, Bill Johnson from Bethel. He says that God can't give what he doesn't have. So, so he believes, and he says, uh, I refuse to create a theology that allows for sickness. So he says that God can't, he can't bring about these things in your life because uh, God can't bring sickness into your life because God's not sick. Uh, he can't bring suffering because God isn't suffering. Now, that's what Paul said a few verses earlier in Colossians. That's a plausible argument. That kind of makes sense. Right? How could you give something away that you don't possibly have? Like that's, that's the argument, and it sounds so good, doesn't it? It's like, oh man, that sounds good. He says, God's in charge of everything, but we make the mistake in thinking that he's in control of everything. That, man. Ah. And he says, it's always God's will to heal. Always, always, always. So if you're sick in this room, if you've got cancer, if you battle something, you know someone that has cancer, he believes that it is absolutely God's will that they are healed in this life now. And so what happens when that doesn't happen? Well, then it's either your faith, you didn't have enough faith. I mean, it's, you, you see the ramifications of this? The, the road we're going down when we just speak to someone and say, hey, in Jesus' name, you're healed. It's God's will to heal you. Then that person doesn't get healed. Then what happens? They think, does God not love me? Is God not real? Is God really not powerful? He quotes uh, Smith Wigglesworth, who has kind of got the ball rolling with Pentecostalism back in like the early 1900s. Uh, Wigglesworth has this quote that Bill Johnson likes to quote. He says, if the spirit's not moving, then I'll move him. See, but <laughs> the Holy Spirit is not a power that we wield. The Holy Spirit wields us with his power. Okay, we, he is not a tool in our hands. We are a tool in his hands. This thing is completely flipped around. It is a man-centric theology. Any theology that is focused on man is wrong. Any theology that starts with man and ends with man is wrong. But see, we like theologies that start and end with us because we're in this thing for us. And that's what I'm saying. Somewhere in our life, somewhere in our mind and our heart, we have some element of this prosperity gospel going on. Now, I'll show you a few verses here just to, just to, just to show you 
And some of these verses are hard for us to digest if we really think about what that's implying, okay? But, but this is a far better alternative than what is being taught by some of these guys. Exodus 4.11, the Lord said to Moses, who has made man's mouth? Who makes man mute or deaf or, or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? He, he's saying, I am in control of everything. It is I who makes people able to see or be blind. Now that doesn't sit well with us, does it? And, and I know that. I know that there's sickness in this room. Now it doesn't mean that God created sickness. It doesn't mean that he likes sickness, but it also doesn't mean he's punishing you. He wants to work this in your life for a purpose for his glory. I was thinking about this guy, uh, Nick Vujicic. Some of you guys know who he is. He was born with no arms and no legs. For, for years when he was younger, he, he, even at age 70, contemplated suicide. <laughs> and just through his life, he's said now, I know that it was God's will that I be born with no arms and no legs because God has gotten so much more glory through my life than he would have if I had all four limbs. Now, does he look forward to getting his four limbs in heaven? Absolutely. We can look forward to that. We can still even pray for healing now, but, but we don't say, I need that in order to have the abundant life that God has called me to. I know that God is in control, even if it doesn't seem like he's in control. I know and I believe that he is working something far greater than I can possibly hope or imagine, even in my suffering, and dare I even say, especially in our suffering. And and so now, a guy like Nick Vujicic, I mean, so is, is it God's will that he wakes up with four limbs one day? I mean, what is that? He would laugh I originally was thinking he'd be offended at that, but no, he would just laugh at it. He's, no, it's God's will that this is, this is my lot in life, and I praise God for it because I've brought him so much glory. And through bringing God glory, then, that's what brings us true joy and fulfillment and purpose and satisfaction. We don't get all that stuff just by having four. Think of how much you take for granted your, your four limbs. So what makes him think, and he doesn't think this, what makes him think that by getting four limbs, then he'll be truly happy. I have four limbs and I'm not truly happy. You see what I'm saying? The grass is always greener on the other side. Okay, so so this is this is why this this okay, let's just move on. (laughs) Genesis 45, 8. Joseph got sold into slavery by his brothers, okay? Thrown in a pit, put in jail for years. He meets up with his brothers later, they feel bad, and he says, you know, it wasn't you who sent me here, it was God. (coughs) Joseph says, God sent me to jail. He sent me here. And here's why. He made me a father to Pharaoh and lord over his house and ruler over all of Egypt. Five chapters later, he says, as for you, brothers, you guys who sold me into slavery, lied to my dad, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. And here's why, to bring about that many people would be kept alive as they are today. See, Joseph, because he finally, through just random course of events, right, just random, he got into Pharaoh's court and God gave him these dreams and he ended up uh, saving millions of people from famine, from dying, because God sent him to jail. God sent him to jail. See, a totally different perspective. Adam and Eve, They sinned, God killed two animals, shed blood to cover their nakedness. But yet God is not a murderer, right? There's no murder in God's heart, but yet he killed two animals. Uh, Noah sent a flood, killed the entire earth, save for eight people. Okay, uh, so God is, is able to do a lot more than we think. See, we like to make God into our image but that's not how it works. Uh, God sent plagues to Egypt. Uh, He sent an evil spirit to torment Saul. Uh, Here's one of my favorite ones. When the Philistines captured the Ark of the Lord um, in uh, 2 Samuel 6, uh, he gave them all uh, hemorrhoids. (laughs) That's kind of (laughs) weird, but 
he gave them hemorrhoids and he had rats infest their land. So you know what they did when they realized that the Lord's after us, he's angry at us, he gave us hemorrhoids. Uh, what, uh, this is a true story. Uh, what, he, what they did is uh, to have a little peace offering to the Lord, they took the ark, they put it on a cart with uh, some animals to pull it back to, uh, to Israel, but to say sorry, they cast uh, tiny little golden rats and golden hemorrhoids and they, and they put them in the ark and said sorry and just sent it back to Israel. And the hemorrhoids went away, and so did the rats. Okay, but the crazy thing is that God sent them hemorrhoids. Just very strange. And I am totally not meaning to be crass, but just to speak to the Bill Johnson quote that God can't give what he doesn't have. God does not have hemorrhoids. Okay. And yet he gave them to them. So I'm just, all right. Now let's just remember this, though. That the worst event in human history was Jesus Dying on the cross, innocent Jesus, the son of God, being killed on the cross. Who sent him to be killed? Who decreed that he would be killed? It was God the Father. It says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth. It wasn't the Romans that killed him. It wasn't the Jews that killed him. It says that he was slain before the foundations of the earth. That means that God the Father said, I want you to go and die. But yet God does not have murder in his heart. God does not have, uh, I want the son of God to die, uh, it, building up in his heart. Right, so God can uh, bring into existence, plan, allow, whatever word helps you sleep at night, uh, any of those things God can do because he's in control of all things. And that is a far better alternative than thinking that Satan is running amok and bringing about all this suffering and all this stuff and God's just sitting back going, man, I, got, I, I, don't, I can't control it. Like, I don't like that alternative. It's not easy to swallow this pill that God causes deaf and blind, but it is a better pill to swallow than the other one. Now here's the thing, so Eliphaz, going back to Eliphaz, given advice, just decide on the matter and it'll be done for you, right? That's what he said to Job, that was his advice. Here's what God says to Eliphaz a few chapters later. Remember, uh, Eliphaz said just uh, decide on the matter, it'll be established for you and light will shine on your ways, Job. Just uh, say it, decree it, believe it, and it's yours. But here's what God says in Job 42. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and your two friends. You haven't spoken of me what's right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job will pray for you and I'll accept Job's prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. He says, Eliphaz, you idiot. You just gave him the worst counsel. That isn't even true. You can't do that. Because here's the thing. Here's what Eliphaz did not know. And here's what Job didn't know. But this is what we get to know because we have the word of God. Eliphaz did not know that God had a specific purpose for Job's suffering. Eliphaz didn't know that, so Eliphaz, in his folly, he goes, Job, just pray that it's gone. So, so Eliphaz was giving Job advice to pray against something that God was doing. Now, Eliphaz didn't know that, that's why Eliphaz just should have kept his mouth shut. And, and so we, we do this thing, we, we, in, we somehow we just believe or we, uh, we assume that everything bad is not from God and so we, we, we just, we get our mind set on this thing that we will not be happy until this thing is gone. Instead, what we should be praying is, God, what are you doing in my life? What are you wanting, how, how are you wanting to bring me closer to your son Jesus? How are you using this to show me that Christ is far better, that I can be satisfied even amidst all of this stuff here? Okay, this is what God is constantly doing through our suffering. So here's, here's the whole, this is the whole thing of the story of Job. Satan came to God and said, your, your, your guy, Job, here's what he's doing. He only loves you because what? He has health and wealth. Because you give him good stuff, that's why he loves you. God says, nope. He loves me because he knows that I'm better than those things. He loves me because he knows that, the, that I'm more beautiful than those things. He loves me because he knows that I'm far greater and worth more than any amount of prosperity or wealth or re other relationships you might have in your life. God, he says, I am greater than all those things and Job knows it. So go ahead, 
have your way with him. I'm gonna prove to you and everyone who ever reads the Bible in the future that I'm better than all that stuff, that I am all that you need, that I am all sufficient, that you can have joy and abundant life even when your life is going down the tubes. If you hold on to the head, just as Paul says, and you're not seeking after this, this other experience, this other thing, this other stuff that you feel like you need to make you happy, if you just hold on to the head, which is Christ, you will be knit together with a growth that is from God. But only if you hold on to him. In James 4, James says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we're gonna go in such and such a town, we're gonna spend a year there, and we're gonna trade and make a profit. So he says, you guys who say and you declare more or less uh, what you're gonna do, but yet you don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. You don't actually know what tomorrow is gonna bring. What, what's your life? You're just a mist that appears for a little time and then it vanishes. Ooh, wow, that's humbling. And yet we think that we can kind of tell the future and we know what's in our future. We know what, you know, uh, exactly what God is doing at all times. But instead you should say this, if the Lord wills, then we'll live and do this or that. And, and sometimes though, the, this kind of prosperity community will say, no, don't ever say that because if you say that, then that's showing you don't have faith. If you just say, well God, if it's your will, then heal, they would say, no, you, you command that sickness to be gone. That's what they would say. Don't say if it's the Lord's will because that just shows you don't have faith. And see, now we're, you know what we're doing now? Now we're taking the Lord's name in vain. We're, we're commanding healing in the name of the Lord when, we, when we're being told, no, you say if it's the Lord's will. And here's what he says. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting is evil. We don't command the Holy Spirit to do anything. We humbly ask him. And then we say, just as Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he died, Father, take this cup from me. If there's any other way we can do this whole dying for sins thing, let's do that. But nonetheless, your will be done, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. So we pray. We say, God, bring, bring healing. We, just, we ask God, if it is your will, heal my son, heal my daughter. But nonetheless, God, your will be done, not mine. Because I trust that if you're doing something in the background that I can't see, then I want that more. I want whatever glorifies you the most. That's what I want. And so some of the ways that we live out this kind of false teaching in our own life uh, on, on more subtle ways is, like I said earlier, sometimes we just we think we deserve better than what we have. But, but here's the thing is that suffering even and, and sickness and all these things, these are just reminders um, of the, the fact that we actually deserve a lot worse. Hey, do you hear what I'm saying here? Like, like everything, anything bad you ever get in this life is merciful compared to what you actually deserve for the sin that we've all committed. Okay, we will always get, we will always, always, always have more and better than what we actually truly deserve. No matter what you're going through, trust me, you and I, were sinful people. We have offended the holy king of the universe. We deserve, deserve far worse than what we actually are, are getting. And so when we have this feeling like God is being unfair or we think that God is a God of karma, well, God, I read my Bible today. How come you didn't do this? God is not a God of karma. He's a God of grace. He gives unmerited favor. Okay, if, if God was a God of karma, you'd get what is coming to you. All right? But he's not. Thankfully, he's not. Okay, you don't want God to be a God of karma. Trust me. Uh, we wait for signs. You know, I'm just waiting for a sign. We, we put out fleeces, you know, it's an Old Testament thing. Uh, it's just, we, we just want cheap shortcuts. We don't really want to get to know God and his heart and his mind and his will through the word of God. We would rather just put out fleeces and wait for, wait for a feeling of peace. Just a feeling. Why do we want a feeling? Because a feeling, uh, going back to that, uh, that one in uh, 2 Timothy, we just want to uh, chase after teachers that are going to give us uh, our own passions. So uh, what better teacher with our own passions than we ourselves? 
So we're just gonna wait for peace and we're not gonna seek out counsel or other friends or the word of God. We're just gonna wait for peace because uh, we know that deep down uh, we deserve better than this and my friends don't really know what I need. I know what I need. I'm just gonna, I have peace about this decision and I'm gonna do it because uh, I, I think it's best for me. Those are the kinds of things that, that we do. A couple more verses here. Um, 1 Timothy chapter six. Verse six, Paul says to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment and godliness going together. We brought nothing into this world and we can't take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with this we'll be content. Because we know that Jesus really is enough. We don't want to elevate the gifts of God above the giver who is God. And this is what we do. We, we, we say, God, if only, answer this question for me. If I only had this, then I'd be happy. Whatever that thing is, if I only had this, then I'd be really satisfied. If I only had this, then I could really live the abundant life that God has promised me. You see, he hasn't given me the ability to have the promise, the, the abundant life until I get this. Th- those things, th- that's when you're elevating the gift above the giver. And what we do when we act like the Holy Spirit is a force that we can wield and we just start uh, telling people just, hey, just believe, just, just believe. And, and we just, just, you know, positive confession, all these things, uh, what we do is we make Jesus into looking like a foolish magician who doesn't even know how to do his own magic tricks. We say, you know, I, the Lord's gonna heal you. I know it, he told me, I got peace about it. Then it doesn't happen. What are we doing? We are shaming the name of Jesus, making him look like a fool. Now, we, 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 we pray for people to get healed. But when we start doing the thing that James says, that arrogance, here's what's gonna happen, I know it. God, God told me, he got this feeling. Uh, the arrogance of that, no, what we say is, you know, if it's God's will, then we're, we're asking that he would heal you, that he would get you that job that you want. Not the job you need, the job you want, right? And, and so we humbly ask God to do these things. We don't uh, command him to do these things. Remembering too that what was it that Jesus was tempted by when he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. Uh, Satan offered him, uh, because he was fasting 40 days, he offered him bread because he was hungry. Uh, He asked him to jump off the pinnacle of the temple to have the angels lift him up. And then the third thing, uh, he said, if you worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. So what's he tempting him with? Health and wealth. I'll make you full, I'll bring some health back to your life. So Satan, this is what, he he even tried to tempt Jesus with these things. And we think that these things fulfill us, but what is Jesus' response? He always went back to the word. He said, no, this is the truth. And we get drawn away into these things. This is the common tactic of the enemy. Uh, Let's just remember that every single apostle uh, died and was martyred, crucified upside down, beheaded, okay? Prosperity gospel didn't work for them, (laughs) right? Uh, We see at least six or seven different guys in the New Testament that got sick, like physically ill. Uh, Timothy always had stomach problems. We think he was like a real, like a nervous wreck. He was a young guy leading this big church, and and so uh, Paul says, you know, for your stomach, you're constantly in chronic pain. Uh, He didn't say, man, brother, just name it, claim it. That's yours. Positive confession. No, you know what he said? He goes, mix a little wine in with your water because wine will settle your stomach. Told him to take some medicine. That's weird. You know, and, and, and Paul said that he had this thorn in the flesh and he pleaded with God to take it away, but three times God said, no, my grace is enough. I've given you enough. You can, you can have this suffering. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh was, but we had this suffering and he goes, I- I'm enough. I'm enough for you. And Paul knows that, that that thing, whatever it was, was meant to keep him humble. There was a greater purpose in the suffering. Okay, and so, so Paul recognized that, and so he stopped asking for it to be gone. Uh, my guess is that a guy like Nick Vujicic probably stopped at some point in his life, stopped asking God to give him limbs, 
And he says, when he was a kid, he used to pray, God, I wanna wake up tomorrow with limbs. But I'm sure at some point, Nick Vujicic got to this place where he said, you know what? His grace is sufficient for me. In my weakness, then I'm strong because God comes in and he takes over. There is more, uh, more, more faith it takes more faith to, to look in the face of uh, suffering and sickness to say, God, you're still good. It, it takes more faith and trust to do that than just to hold on for some, what might end up being a pipe dream. Okay, I wanna close on this. Two verses here. In Job chapter one, verse 21. Job says this after being afflicted. And I hope this is our prayer as a church, that we can grow in this and be prepared for not if, but when the day of suffering comes into our life in whatever form or fashion, whether it's criticism or it's some kind of persecution or mockery of your faith or whatever, or if it's something very tragic, cancer, death, poverty. Job 121, he said, naked I came from my, brother, my mother's womb and naked shall I return. I, 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 we, we, we pine for prosperity and wealth, but he's like, you know what, you can't take any of it with you. Uh, you, can, you can be healed by the Lord 900 times in his life and guess what, eventually you're gonna die. All right, so we, we get on this treadmill. We're not going anywhere. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will return. But the Lord gives and the Lord has taken away from me now. He lost his family, he lost his health, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. Even though he knew that it was God who took away from him, he did not charge God with wrongdoing because he knows that everything is God's and God can do as he pleases. And he says, you know what? God is still good. He is still a good God, even though he gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord because he's good, because I know that he's in control of everything and I can trust him. And here's what he says a few verses, uh, chapters later in Job 13, 15. This is what Job says. He goes, though he slay me, though God will slay me, though he may kill me, though my heart and flesh will, will be devoured, though God himself will slay me, yet will I trust in him yet will I praise his name even though God may slay me I will trust in him and I know I can because he was slain for me we don't judge God's goodness based on our circumstances we base God's goodness on the cross of Jesus Christ we base his goodness on the gospel not on what's going on in our life we look back to the cross and say God is good he died for us. Why would we doubt his love for us? Even if everything around us, even if the world around us is falling from beneath our feet, we can look at the cross and we say, he's good and he loves us. He slain his own son from before the foundations of the earth for us. He chose us in him before the foundations of the world. This is why we love him. We don't love him because of the things he gives or takes away. We love him because he gave us his son and he gave us unmerited grace grace and favor and love. This is the God that we serve. This is the God we worship. This is the God that we love. And we know that our future, we know that everything that we will ever need or want is being stored up in heaven for us. We can't even get our hands on it. It's being kept away for us. We look forward to that day. We do, we look forward to that day. This doesn't mean we're, we're sadists that are just like, oh, whoa, was me going around. You know, we, we look forward to the day when, when it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that all of his enemies will be put underneath his feet. We look forward to the day where it says that the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. We look forward, as it says in Romans 8, that the earth now is even groaning and waiting for the end to finally come so we can all be released from this curse. We look forward to that day. But in the meantime, God will give and he will take away and we will bless his name. We will say, God, though you slay me, yet I will trust you, I will praise you, I will love you because I know you're good. Okay. Revelation 21, this is my last verse here. This is the very end, this is, what, this is our hope, this is our hope. 
We may not get all the stuff we want in this life, but this is what we will get. This is our hope. This is what we fix our eyes on. Revelation 21, verse one. I saw a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, just like we're all gonna pass away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall finally be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Right now, guys, we're living in the former things. Okay, but there will be a day when those former things will pass away. But that time is not now. We live in a fallen and cursed world still. And he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, write this down because these words are trustworthy and they are true. And so he said to me, it is done. I'm the alpha, the omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payments. You're gonna get everything you want and need. The one who conquers, that's us. We're gonna conquer. Remember it says in Romans 8, we're more than conquerors. All right, if we've been rooted and established, Okay, and if you're a believer, you've been rooted and established, you're more than a conqueror. So the one who conquers, that's us. We're gonna have his heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. Let's um, pray and thank the Lord for the promises that we know that are ours. Father God, we we ask you, Lord, to, that your spirit would probe our hearts, bring to light the things that we think that we need to be happy, to be fulfilled, to live the abundant life. And Lord, by the, the power of your word, the power of your truth, the power of the gospel, convince us that that's a lie. Show us, Lord, that we, we believe lies. And we know we're gonna be fighting these lies off. We're gonna be weeding these things out of the garden of our own hearts for really the rest of our life. And we know that there's not gonna be a, a day on this earth that uh, we will be completely free of, of sin. But today, we ask that you'd bring to mind the, the particular weeds or sin or uh, belief that you want us to just take head on right now today that you would expose these things to us, Lord, that you'd give us a desire to run and repent of it. And more than anything, Lord, that we would see your son Jesus as being completely sufficient, completely satisfactory for us, that he would fulfill uh, everything that we're longing for, that we would latch onto him, the head who is uh, giving us that growth that grows from God. Help us run from these, uh, these lesser, inferior idols and lesser gods and lesser, really, what are non-gospels. Let us run from those. Or just search our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.